Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening as the Continents Foundation of Australia presents Promoting Healthy Bladder and Bowel Habits at School. Um, I am Bronwyn Robinson. I'm the Education Manager for the Foundation. And in a lifetime, or maybe 20 or more years ago, I was also a primary teacher. So this is a topic that for me really resonates. I'm delighted that this evening I'm joined by my colleague, Janine Armacita. And um, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about um, Janine's background. Uh, she's a registered nurse and midwife, and she holds a graduate diploma in nursing uh, with a child and family health nursing component, as well as a graduate certificate in neurological incontinence nursing. Uh, she currently works as a maternal and child health nurse at an early parenting centre, and she's also a continence nurse advisor for the National Continence Helpline. We'll talk about that quite a bit through today's uh, this evening's presentation. Janine also has a special interest in children's continence issues. And in 2012, she was one of the lead people from the Continence Foundation of Australia's special project into healthy bladder and bowel habits in children. So what are we doing tonight? Well, for a start, we hope that you find this relevant, useful for you in the classroom. Uh, but we also do have some clearly defined learning outcomes that we hope will be uh, helping you uh, to get a sense of what it is we're trying to achieve. So those learning outcomes, we really want to uh, encourage you to be able to think about the teacher's role in creating an appropriate environment for children so that they can develop healthy bladder and bowel habits. We want you to be able to uh, explain why some children uh, who are at school are not yet continent, and that's a real issue. Um, I think uh, particularly at this time of year, nearly the end of term one, lots of little preps uh, and I'm sure that you're finding that you still have daily if 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 not multiple children on a daily basis who demonstrate incontinence. Um, we want you to be able to describe the potential physical and emotional risks within the school setting for those children who are dealing with incontinence and there's lots of evidence around that and it can have a profound impact. And finally, we want you to be able to uh, recognise the importance of working with parents uh, as you manage their child who may have incontinence in your classroom setting. So we hope that as we go through this presentation, each of those learning objectives will be clearly articulated for you. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Janine. Thanks, Janine. Uh, thank you, Bronwyn. Um, so basically, I certainly want this to be interactive. I want you to ask questions as we go along. Um, and you may even want to share a story as to when you were a child at school, you may remember someone wetting their pants, or it may have even been yourself. I can remember when I was back at school, a little boy in grade two who used to wet his pants and you know, just giving him a sympathetic smile, um, really feeling for him. And the teacher was really ill-equipped to deal with him. Um, and we certainly know that continence issues hit the news every now and then. And it's not because um, teachers are trying to give students a hard time. It's just because you're not um, equipped to deal with them. It really can be very hard for you. So hopefully this helps, but please ask questions as we go along. So the role of the teacher. The teacher is certainly pivotal, has a pivotal role to play in promoting healthy bladder and bowel habits and in the management of children with incontinence. It's really important that you remember you're not alone um, and that you feel you are supported within your school community. So it is important to have a school-based strategy in place. And also that other staff support you if you do have a child with a continence issue or for you to support other teachers. It's important that uh, parents are involved so you're in that key position to actually inform parents about what happens during school hours. And if you think about it, nearly 50% of a child's hours are spent um, at school. So, or waking hours I should say, are spent at school. So teachers certainly have the potential to positively or negatively impact on a child's continence issues. Um, you can always phone the National Continence Helpline for advice and support. Um, it's manned by continence nurses and we can give you uh, basic uh, strategies, also referral sources 
and some written information which may help to support you and the parents. And you can always give the parents our phone number too, of course. But most important is that you don't feel alone and that you are supported within your community. And the teacher models attitudes and behaviours towards children's bladder and bowel habits within the classroom and also the broader our school community. It's really important to remember that non-verbal communication is often stronger than verbal communication. So if a child comes up to you and says, oh, little Johnny's you know, wet his pants again, you've got to really be mindful not to roll your eyes and just try to deal with it in a positive way. I know that can be challenging, but it is really important because you certainly play an important role in um, encouraging positive and healthy behaviours for all children and how other children respond to the child with a continence issue. You also act as a uh, conduit between a child's continence at school and parental awareness of any issues. So there needs to be um, support between school and home and vice versa. So why is it important? Certainly this isn't surprising to you. We know um, of the psychological impact and research confirms that children who experience continence issues can also experience decreased self-esteem, increased anxiety, social embarrassment, rejection from peers. They may also be subjected to or de demonstrate overt bullying behaviour. They may demonstrate oppositional conduct issues. It can also significantly affect the quality of their school work due to poor concentration because they're worried about their continence issue or trying to hold on all the time. They also often have increased absenteeism. We also know that they often have a lower quality of life score than their peers. So we know bladder and bowel problems often have a negative impact on children. So it's important to promote healthy bladder and bowel habits to hopefully help to negate some of this. As a teacher, you're in a unique position to help support children with continence problems, to help negate them from developing self-esteem issues or becoming victims or perpetrators of bullying. Towards the end of this presentation, we'll have a quick look at the Toilet Tactics Kit, which was developed by the Continence Foundation of Australia, to help raise awareness of bladder and bowel health in schools and to also improve or maintain the quality of the school toilets. So if you have really good toilets, you've got a new school, good toilets, it's really important that you also maintain them. And that's, you know, toilet tactics can also help with that, as well as improving toilets, which need improving. Um, I think the most important thing is to remember that G these children require support and understanding. I'd also strongly advocate that these children have a care plan in place. Now all states and territories do have health care plans uh, which do include continents uh, in the toilet tactics kit. We also have a really basic care plan um, but ideally you use your state or territories uh, care plans. So certainly some myths. Um, children who wet or soil themselves um, they do it because they're lazy, attention seeking, uh, plain old naughty. Um, children keep asking to go to the toilet because they're avoiding schoolwork. They want to get into trouble in the toilet, they want to get into mischief. Or they're just too busy at lunchtime or recess to go to the toilet. Um, but I really want to reassure you that these children aren't doing it on purpose. There is a reason why it's happening, a medical reason why it's happening, and they do need support um, and understanding. So let's just have a quick look at the incidence. We know 3 to 12% of children aged between 5 and 17 years of age suffer from daytime wetting. Daytime wetting is certainly more common in girls. Nearly 4.2 to 32% of children with 
Wetting problems have dysfunctional voiding, which I'll explain a little further on. One in five five-year-olds wet the bed, so it's quite common at that age. So it can still go on. One in 50 adolescents wet the bed. And we know that 0.5 to 1% of children can go on into adulthood as bedwetters. Constipation can affect up to nearly 30% of all children. And this can lead on to fecal soiling, which affects about 1 to 3% of children. We also know that there's a direct correlation between constipation and urinary incontinence. So there was an incident-based um, focused study which was undertaken in Sydney from one group of children in their first year of school in New South Wales. And it showed that 16.5% of children had experienced one or more episodes of wetting in the last six months. 2% had wet twice or more per day. And 0.7% were wet every day. The overall prevalence of wetting at school was, uh, was about 19.2% in this cohort of students. And they had a mean age of about 5.9 years of age. I think what's interesting about that data in particular, Janine, is of those some 19.2% of children uh, who went home and their parents reported that they had wet themselves, only 3% of those children had been reported as having wet themselves by their teachers. So there was a gap between what they were going home and telling mum and dad that they had wet themselves at school, and yet they weren't telling their classroom teacher. And so one of the things we need to find out is why were they not telling their classroom teacher? And I think that also highlights the importance between really good communication between both parents and teachers, that the um, parents actually feel comfortable to talk to you about their child as well um, and know that, that they're not going to be judged for it, that you know we can make sure that these children are well supported. So let's just have a really quick look at some basic anatomy and physiology. We have the urinary tract, the upper urinary tract, and that consists of your kidneys and your ureters. And in the lower urinary tract, which is the bladder, the urethra, and the urethral sphincters. Now the kidneys, they're pretty amazing little organs. They're about the size of your fist and just um, sit mid-back on either side of the, the spinal cord. And their role is to filter wastes and fluids, maintain electrolyte balance and acid balance, to maintain homeostasis. They also are really important in the production of hormones, such as erythropoietin, which helps to stimulate red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Uh, renin, which is important for help maintaining blood pressure. They even play a role in the activation of vitamin D. So they have a lot of roles to play and they're really amazing little organs. The only um, thing I, negative I'd say about your kidneys is that you can actually do nearly 90% of damage to your kidneys before you even know that you have kidney disease. Um, so yeah, it's a bit scary actually. Um, and then let's have a look at the lower uh, urinary tract and that consists of your bladder and your urethra. And their role is the um, storage, of course your bladder is for the storage, and periodic elimination of urine. Um, and it's really important to remember that this is a complex voluntary and involuntary neurological process. So bladder control. Achieving bladder control during development is related to three anatomical factors. You need to reach your normal bladder storage function. And one way that we work out roughly what um, a child should be able to hold in their bladder is we multiply their age by 30 and add 30. So if you had a, a five-year-old, um, 30 times five is 150 plus 30, 180. So roughly you'd expect um, a child of around five years of age to be able to hold about 180 mils in their bladder. It's also important for the maturation of the urethral sphincter function and the development of neurological 
voluntary control of the urethral of the um, sphincter function. So they've got to be able to relax their sphincters and open them up as well. Um, we normally expect that toilet training is complete by four years of age. And if a child is still regularly wetting at the age of four, it is really important that um, the parents know and you really strongly encourage these parents to, uh, to get these children to have a medical assessment because we need to find out why there's a delay and what we can do to get them continent as soon as possible. So the filling, storage and emptying of the bladder. During the filling um, stage of the bladder, the uh, pressure within the bladder slowly increases and we have stretch receptors within the bladder wall and what that they do is initiate a contraction or the urge to void. Now this reflex can be voluntary inhibited. Though if you're in the right place at the right time, you'll go to the toilet, relax and go to the toilet. Um, it's really important to remember that proper emptying of the bladder is a coordinated process from the neural circuits in the brain um, through the spinal cord to the smooth muscle of the bladder, urethral sphincters, um, and the pelvic floor muscles need to work in harmony to achieve complete emptying of the bladder and also to help maintain continence. Now the pelvic floor muscles, just to give you a bit of an idea how big they are, basically they run, uh, I'll just get my little pointer happening here, um, they run from the coccyx through to the pubic bone and in females the urethra, vagina and rectum all pass through and in males of course you've got the urethra and the rectum pass through in males. If you um, pop your hands under your sitting bones on either side and if you rock from side to side you can actually feel the basic width of um, the pelvic floor muscles and then of course if you feel from your coccyx through to pubic bone that'll give you um, their length. Um, roughly they're about the size of um, two cupped hands together. Now with children we don't normally talk about their pelvic floor muscles because we can confuse the emptying mechanism. What we talk about with children um, when they go to the toilet is really about relaxing uh, and just letting go. Now we'll just have a quick look at dysfunctional voiding. As I said, this affects between 4.2 to nearly 32% of children with wetting problems. And what they do is habitually contract their urethral sphincter so they don't relax. They're actually squeezing the sphincter all the time. Now when we normally go to the toilet, we should just sit and relax or if a boy's standing, it's important that they don't squeeze their penis and that's something that sometimes uh, little boys will do is uh, squeeze their penis tightly and play games with the flow of urine which isn't really a good idea because it can interfere with uh, complete emptying. Little girls are often told, and this is something I was certainly told when I was little, not to sit on public toilets. And so what happens then, you're hovering over, you're not relaxing the pelvic floor muscles adequately and it can interfere with the emptying. Occasionally there may be a stricture, so a narrowing of the urethra um, which can cause the wee not to flow out properly. When you listen to the flow of your urine and you're relaxed, it should sound like a bell curve. So it starts off softly, so you may get a shh and then it gets uh, louder shh, and it tapers off. With abnormal voiding or dysfunctional voiding, what happens is you get a statico um, printout of someone's voiding or you can hear it. They go shh, 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 shh. It's not a nice even flow. And um, often it is just teaching these children to relax. Um, but if that doesn't work, they really need to be assessed in case they do have some sort of anatomical 
um, abnormality, some sort of stricture which may be causing this. Uh, Janine, we've actually got a question that's come through regarding uh, someone wetting themselves. Um, thank you for sending this question through and for others listening, don't forget that you can actually type in your question and we will we'll endeavour to get to all of them during the, the course of the presentation. So this one was about whether it's normal for a student to actually not even recognise that they've wet themselves. This is a young girl, she's been wetting herself uh, and now is getting really uh, anxious about wetting herself and is now doing it sometimes up to three times a week. But then she goes through periods where she doesn't wet at all. Um, they're wondering what they can do to help manage this and what might be causing it. Thanks, Roman, and thank you whoever sent that in. Um, I think it is really important that you liaise with the parents and talk to them about your concerns. This child obviously needs to have a health assessment to find out what the cause is. Now, there can be a number of causes. Um, one could be regarding constipation because we know bladder and bowel can certainly affect each other, but particularly constipation, it may be a time that for some reason the child hasn't been and opened their bowels for a few days, so their bladder is more unstable at that particular time because the faeces is taking up room within the pelvic region. Um, is there something going on in the classroom at that time? Is there something with the lesson that makes this child more anxious? Um, we know a lot of people, you know, when you get really anxious, you may actually produce more urine because everything's on hyper alert. Uh, is there something happening at home? You know, is there fighting amongst the siblings or parents or something that, that may also be impacting on them? There's lots of different reasons why it may be happening and it's, it's really trying to nut out what's happening, why one day she'd be continent and another day not. Is she having coke one morning, which um, we'd all like to think doesn't happen, but we know that some children's diet mightn't be ideal. We know that fizzy drinks, but particularly something like coke, can make the bladder more unstable. So if the bladder's more unstable, it contracts more and can make, lead on um, that more likelihood of wetting. So there's a lot of different things that need to be explored. So first of all, I'd be talking to the parents, wanting a health professional to um, assess this child and do a con proper continence assessment so we can really nut out what's going on um, so this child is well supported, that you're well supported and everyone understands what they need to do to help this child and hopefully prevent it from happening of course. So why are some children not continent when they start school? Voluntary bladder and bowel control, it's learned at school, at, um, at toilet training, sorry. And though it can be challenged by a variety of factors, such as the child develops, um, uh, develops resulting in incontinence, so they just don't develop properly. There are medical reasons, such as constipation. They may have had a urinary tract infection or pain. Environmental influence, such as resisting the use of school toilets. Um, at the very start of the year, I actually had a telephone call. We were only a week into the start of the school year of a little um, prep, oh, sorry, who's now grade one. Um, during prep, he had a, a day wedding issue at school. During the school holidays, he was completely con continent. Back to school, within a week, he started wetting every day. And once we nutted out a few things, I asked the mother, what the school toilets were like. And she actually stated that he said he would rather wet his pants than use the school toilets. And that's a huge statement. Um, so that's where I guess I'd really encourage something like the Toilet Tactics Program, which we'll talk about later, um, to really um, try to improve the school toilets. Because I'm sure he's not the only child at school who's doing a similar thing, who's really trying to avoid the school toilets. And sometimes it's some really simple strategies that don't have to cost the school um, a lot of money, but can really help promote healthy bladder and bowel habits within these children. Um, there are some children who um, may, for some reason, have had some interruption to the complete development of their neural pathways. Um, so that, of course, really needs to be explored. 
uh, it's also important to understand that there is a really close relationship between bladder and bowel issues. And we know um, with children with constipation, often if we resolve the constipation, the day and night wetting can also resolve. So there's a really strong correlation. Janine, we've had another question come through and I really can't wait to hear your answer to this one. Um, this particular person writes that they've got a six-year-old boy and uh, this particular boy refuses to use the toilet paper when he's wiping. Um, he only uses baby wipes while he's at school and apparently mum still wipes him when he's at home after toileting. So given that toilet paper is universal and found in all toilets and baby wipes aren't, um, and the issue with dirty wipes that can't be flushed. Do you have any solutions? Okay, I guess one thing, um, sometimes it is hard to, to change certain behaviours. Um, if um, they're using wipes, I guess make sure they're flushable wipes. That would hopefully help. The other thing is though you don't want a child putting down six um, flushable wipes uh, because it can certainly block your um, your sewer system, which you don't want to happen, really one or two is more than enough. I guess the other thing I would uh, try to encourage with this child is to develop a really good bowel routine. So try to get the mum on board um, to get a regular bowel motion prior to starting school. And we'll talk a little bit further on about how and when is a good time to really sit on the toilet to encourage someone to empty their bowel prior to school because if um, they're completely empty prior, then hopefully you won't be having this issue at all. And also, it probably depends on mum's um, understanding a little bit too. And so it'd be also trying to get mum to try to encourage his independence as much as possible as well. And Yes, that uh, sounds to me like that would be quite a tricky discussion to have, but a fairly important one. Um, we've also had another one through uh, with one of the, the kindies um, who was able to sleep without wetting at all. Uh, however, when they get to school, they're wetting several times a week. So the question is, is this a physical issue if they can mm. actually get through the night without wetting? It is certainly unusual whether there is something hormonal that, that's out of whack. Um, but I'd be wondering why this child, if you, uh, I don't know whether you're doing prompted toileting at all with this child being at kinder, whether you can encourage them to go to the toilet every couple of hours and to sit down and relax. Do they have some sort of aversion to using the toilet? Are they wet on the weekend when they're um, in their parents' care um, in their own environment or are they happy to use the toilet in a dry? And that will help allude you as to what some of the causes are. So if they're able to be dry on the weekend, there's something happening as to why they don't want to use the um, kindy toilets. Is it because they're open they're, um, and they're too embarrassed to uh, go to the toilet when other children can walk in? Uh, so it may be an environmental issue that's impacting. Thanks very much for that, Janine. And um, my thanks to go out. We've just had some lovely feedback for your answer to the previous question about mum still having to, uh, or mum still wiping her six-year-old son after he goes to the toilet. Um, well done for having had that conversation with mum on previous occasions. Um, I think just that constant reinforcement hopefully will help. And uh, reminding her that she's not going to be around every activity that her son does to actually take up that particular role. And it probably is time for him to learn. But well done for raising the question, for handling it in that way um, at school. That's great. I guess the only other thing I would wonder with that child, is his bowel motion extremely soft? And, and uh, that would be the other thing is uh, as to what um, his actual bowel motions are like. And so whether he doesn't, you know, a continence assessment to just uh, get some recording and find out what his bowel motions are like because there are some people who do have uh, extremely soft sloppy poo which means he is going to end up in more of an issue than someone who has a nice um, smooth easily passed stool. So that may be something that needs to be addressed as well. So are you suggesting that mum's taking some of the work out of having to wash all those undies all the time with those little telltale marks on them, Janine? Yeah, well yeah, well that's it. Maybe he's you know telltale marks on them, Janine. Yeah, well yeah, well that's it. Maybe he's you know, 
there, there may be another reason why you still motion just isn't quite right and, and so that may be something that does need to be addressed. Thanks Janine. Okay, so let's um, move on. Okay, physical health. We know children with continence problems are at higher risk of having continence problems into adulthood. We know some children avoid using school toilets. So they have decreased voiding frequency, which is probably a bit like this little um, girl at kinder, that she doesn't go to the toilet at all when she's at kinder. Um, with the decreased voiding though, it can put children at an increased risk of urinary tract infections, which can lead on to upper urinary tract damage. Certainly day wetting, because there's only so long we can hold on, and then yeah, eventually the wee's going to have to come out. Constipation can end up a really vicious cycle because we don't go to the toilet when we need to. And that certainly uh, can lead on to faecal soiling. Um, and even decreased fluid intake um, at school can happen because of wetting uh, issues. I remember having another phone call from a mum whose son was now nine years of age and started bedwetting again. He had been dry um, for over 12 months but he had a wetting accident at school. And since and the reason he had a wetting accident was because he wasn't allowed to go to the toilet. And since having that wetting accident, he's decreased his fluid intake at school. So he's doing all his drinking between getting home from school and going to bed, which has led him on to wetting again at night. So what I suggested to the mum is to talk to the teacher, you know, so this child is able to go to the toilet if he needs to, to build his confidence. So then he gained his confidence with drinking throughout the day and that just flipped over and um, allowed him to become continent again at night. Um, so I guess don't ever think that um, the, what happens at the daytime or in the classroom is not going to have an impact at home or at night because it certainly can. Janine, when we were putting this presentation together, I was the one who chose that particular picture that mm. you can see at the moment with the uh, beautiful floors and the bright yellow and red. And you pointed out a few things that are actually not right with it. And I have to say, I didn't realise when I chose it, but they were really good points that you picked up on. Would you like to share those? Yeah. Well, we can certainly um, notice that there are no toilet seats. The other thing, if you notice in this cubicle here, the toilet paper is sitting on top of the toilet, on top of the cistern. So there's no way a child's going to be able to uh, reach around and grab the toilet paper after being on the toilet. So sometimes toilets can appear really good to us, but it's not unless you're using them all the time that you start to understand whether they're functional or not. And that's, I guess, one good thing of, um, say, the toilet tactics is surveying your whole school community so you understand what the students think about the toilets um, and so you can address any issues. We've had another question come yeah. through, Janine. Uh, this is a fairly specific one in terms of the area. This is a child with autism um, and wondering whether that uh, a child with this condition would actually have a lack of awareness regarding the need to go to the toilet. Look, sometimes uh, they can have delayed toileting that's not uncommon. It's also not uncommon for them to have some chronic constipation and that can certainly lead on to issues with both their bladder um, being incontinent of urine but also uh, faecal soiling. The other thing is they may avoid using the toilets because of sensory issues. So it's trying to work out ways to make the toilet friendly towards that child so they're actually happy to go to the toilet. They feel safe secure, um, so they will go to the toilet and that will also help to limit um, any accidents and things. Thanks Janine. Okay, I'll just skip this one because I've doubled this side. Um, let's just have a look at um, holding manoeuvres and this is something that you probably often see within the classroom. A child trying to inhibit a detrusive contraction Detrusa is just another, or just a medical fancy name basically for bladder. Um, so what they can do is 
squat with heel pressure on the perineum, known as the Vincent site. You often see little girls doing that in the classroom. Um, you may see someone um, applying perineal pressure or squeezing their penis, little boys squeezing their penis to try to stop the flow of urine and to get over that contraction of their bladder. Some children stand on their tiptoes. Others can jiggle and you'll even hear parents say that their child's doing a wee dance. Now suppressing the urge to void. One thing which is really important to understand is the kidneys are constantly making urine. If a child's not allowed to go to the toilet and has to wait for a break, so they suppress that urge to go. Now they may be able to do that the first time. But the problem is they go out for recess and they forget they need to go to the toilet because they're not getting another urge. The blood is not contracting down again. So they're not getting that sensation. But when they return to class and settle in, they then may get a second contraction. So this time the urge can often be stronger, it may even be painful, as the blood is fuller and it's becoming increasingly difficult for them to hold on. It's really important to remember that it's unrealistic to expect that a child can hold on for another one and a half to two hours um, until there's another break. And you've got to also weigh up, because a child's in the classroom, are they actually taking on board what you're teaching? If they're too busy concentrating on trying to hold on, they're not going to be concentrating on the lesson in hand. So I guess we would certainly strongly advocate that you allow a child to go to the classroom. They go, empty their bladder, they come back, they're ready to sit down and learn. Um, so it's a win-win situation really. Thanks Janine. We have uh, another question through. Uh, this one, uh, congratulations to the teacher who sent this one in because they're actually thinking about their role uh, and, and the impact that they might have on this child. So this is an older child, about nine years old in, in grade three um, and they're having regular accidents both with their poo and with their wee mm -hmm. and they're happening sometimes daily. So this teacher has been uh, asking and rewarding the child to try and go to the toilet on the hour every two hours, um, even if the student says they don't need to go. Now they're wondering if that kind of promotion of it is going to um, have a negative impact uh, on the student in the long run. They also query that the, the, the child has mild autism and ADHD, so that they tend to get fixated on technology and activities. Um, but the problem is that those accidents, when they do happen, are very unpredictable. Right. Thanks. Great question. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there. Now, certainly, um, if you're having both faecal and uh, wetting accidents, often the culprit can be the bowels because we know that 89% um, of children with chronic constipation who day wet if we resolve the constipation, the day wetting resolves. Um, for night wetting, um, if we've got a child who night wets and um, soils or um, has chronic constipation, if we resolve the constipation, the night 63% of cases, the night wetting resolves. So there's a really strong link between bladder and bowel. And so it's really important that this child is assessed properly by a medical professional to see whether they do have any bowel issues. And if they do have chronic constipation, it's really important that that's addressed. And we will um, discuss that shortly, how that should be addressed effectively. Because if we can do that pelvic region, it stops the um, bladder from being so unstable. There are some children who can have true bladder instability where the, the bladder just contracts more. Um, if that was the cause, sometimes um, there's medication that, that's available that can help that bladder be more stable. But usually if there's a bowel component as well as in this case, um, I'd be putting my money that this child has chronic constipation which is leading to both um, the soiling and the day wetting. As far as a child going to the toilet every hour, that's a bit too frequent. Um, normal to go to the toilet is anywhere between four to seven times a day. So um, look, every two hours is okay.
but anything uh, much under that, particularly as a nine-year-old, we would expect they should be able to hold um, that little bit longer. I guess this is where a, um, a proper healthcare plan in place would be really good, so then he's actually had a proper medical assessment, and then that will be able to help support and guide you how to support this child. So I'd really strongly recommend to try to get that in place. Um, and then hopefully this child um, will be sorted, but I'm tipping my money that this child has some chronic constipation, uh, just with the limited information we know. And he may also really need to be assessed for um, autism too, so it is important that he has a paediatric assessment as well as a continence assessment. Thanks, Janine, and thanks for that question. That was that was very good. Thanks. So, voiding, right place, right time. Basically, boys can sit or stand, which is no surprise, and girls need to sit. We need to make sure they're relaxed. And as I said, for boys, it's important that they're not squeezing their penis hard, that they've just got sitting uh, relaxed in their hand. It's important not to force the urine out, to push or strain when you urinate and not to hover over the toilet seat. So it is really important that girls feel comfortable and confident to sit down on the toilet seats. So the toilets need to be clean. It's important to take the time to make sure the bladder um, feels empty. Um, by mid-morning, we expect the urine colour to be straw colour. Uh, and that helps to indicate that a child has been drinking enough as well. Any more questions at the moment? We're good. Uh, no, we're doing okay at the moment. Okay. But, uh, don't, don't hesitate to send in your questions. Please do. Um, now, we might just move on to bowels, and this will, um, I guess, talk a little bit more about this child who's having the day wedding and soiling accidents. So, if we look um, at the large bowel, uh, just some basic anatomy and physiology, we have the ascending colon the transverse colon, the descending colon, the zygmoid colon, the rectum, and the anus. If you notice here, between the rectum and the anus, there's a spot here which is like a bit of a corner. It's another area that can help maintain um, continence. And that's called the anorectal junction. And I'll talk about um, how to sit on the toilet a little bit further on because it's really important that we do sit on the toilet properly because what that can do is help to straighten out this junction here, the anorectal junction, to help faeces come out uh, straight and easily come out. Uh, the other important thing to um, understand is food and fluid move forward and back in a shuttle position. So it moves forward and back as uh, nutrients and um, fluid is absorbed before it reaches uh, the rectum to be expelled. Now about 20 minutes, half an hour after a meal, we have what we call the gastrocolic reflex. And what that does, it's a time when we have mass peristalsis through the bowel. So normally the contents just move forward and back. But 20 minutes to half an hour after a meal, the contents can move 30 even 40 centimetres within the bowel. So that's a really good time to sit on the toilet. Now ex we expect defecation should only take three to five minutes maximum. Um, and often this gastrocolic reflex is strongest in the morning. So it's really good if children can get up um, a little bit earlier before school, have breakfast, even uh, something warm with brekkie, have a little play, and then 20 minutes, half an hour later, have a little sit on the toilet for three to five minutes. And hopefully they'll get that sensation to empty their bowel. As we said earlier, the six-year-old um, who was having trouble wiping their bottom, hopefully if we could get um, that child to empty their bowel prior to getting to school, then it won't be something that you'll need to, to deal with. Uh, but again, it's just really encouraging healthy bladder and bowel habits. It's also um, important, again, that all the neural pathways are intact to aid defecation. And for defecation to occur, of course, the pressure above in the rectum, I'll just 
just show you my dot. Um, the pressure here in the rectum needs to be greater than the anus. If the anal pressure is greater than the rectum, what's going to happen is it's going to shoot the faeces back up into the zygmoid colon. So that's why children need to be relaxed um, and happy to go to the toilet and don't hold on because they're going to send it back into the zygmoid colon. And it's very similar um, with the bladder, of course, is that the um, urethral sphincter needs to be relaxed uh, to allow urine to come out. The bladder pressure, the pressure has to be greater above than below for urine to come out. Same with the bowel. The pressure needs to be greater above than below for the faeces to come out. All right. Now, bowel issues, as we said, constipation can affect up to nearly 30% of all children. And this can lead um, on to fecal swelling, which affects about 1% to 3% of children. And constipation accounts for over 25% of visits to gastroenterologists. So it is quite common and something um, that um, parents do take their children to see gastroenterologists about. Um, Janine, we've got another question, and this is very much uh, around the topic for soiling. Um, so this is a, a student who um, soils himself up to three times a day during the school day. Mm -hmm. um, he goes to the toilet every 15 to 20 minutes, but it hasn't seemed to help prevent the soiling. Um, so the teacher is asking A for some strategies um, and also recognising that this is a very difficult thing because uh, the school requires a buddy system. So the buddy has to go out and wait in, in the toilet as well during this time. So the, this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is having a real impact on learning uh, for this particular teacher. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Yeah, look, it's certainly a difficult um, situation. Unfortunately, with bowels, there is no quick fix. It is a long-term process, and there needs to be support between school and at home. And I guess one thing I would be encouraging um, for this child, they, if they haven't seen a health professional, of course, to see a health professional. They um, may need a um, bowel ultrasound if the parent doesn't think that this child's chronically constipated. That's, again, probably what I'd be tipping my money on because it can be quite common and lead on to faecal soiling. Having um, chronic constipation can lead to spontaneous anal dilatation. So bits of faeces can sneak out all the time and these children are completely unaware of it happening. One thing I would be encouraging this child to sit on the toilet um, about half an hour after meals for three to five minutes, but it's really important that this child is supported at home and if a health professional deems this child needs to have um, a good laxative management program, that it is followed through with a good sitting uh, regime as well. We've got one other question uh, around uh, soiling as well, Janine. This one is a child who does have a disability and seems unaware of urine and bowel movements mm. um, and is currently being toilet uh, to timed, doing timed toilet regularly, um, but doesn't usually void. Um, and where the question is whether this particular child would be better going back into pull-ups. Mm -hmm. So I suppose there's two parts to this in terms of the impact on the child if they go back into pull-ups, but also the impact on the teacher if, if this regime as it currently is continues to uh, move forward but not having the um, impact that uh, is required. It is really challenging. Um, I don't know whether you're at a special school or um, at a mainstream school, how much support um, you have available for this child. All those things are going to impact, I guess, as to how this child's managed because it is hard if you're in a mainstream school and this child has no um, support worker at all with them, a, a support teacher with them. Um, Certainly having a health professional assess them, they will be able to help you um, individually work with this family to work out whether that is something that may need to be considered. It's something that I would never say never because um, certainly OCH health and safety is it can be a real issue and um, you know maintaining, um, you know, preventing infection and those sorts of things. 
Uh, ideally, we don't usually like to put children back into pull-ups unless we have a really good reason. Um, but I think a proper health assessment is really important by a continence health professional um, and they will certainly be able to um, help guide you. Um, and I'll show you some uh, a couple of products um, towards the end of the presentation which may also uh, be able to help you. It's also important if a child does have any bowel issues that you do have uh, a care plan in place with um, parents having to send a, a change of clothes, maybe some uh, some wipes, a Ziploc bag to help keep in the odour also is really important. But also we've got to work out why this is happening and if they do have um, chronic constipation with faecal overflow, uh, well they'll, they're certainly going to be need, you know, need to be treated with laxatives long term as well. Thanks Janine. Um, so looking at poo, basically what's normal? Um, we know that uh, number four, a smooth thin sausage is basically the pinnacle of all poos. Um, you'll find that most people um, go between three and five. If you've got a child in the one and type two stool, that's when you're starting to get um, constipated and you may start to get that backlog. And then if you've got the really loose watery stool, of course um, a child risks soiling because the uh, fecal fluid just oozes out. As far as going to the toilet, what's normal? Anything from three times a day to three times a week is considered normal. So there's a huge variation. So uh, most causes of um, Constipation and non-organic, known as functional constipation, basically they ignore the um, call for stool, but they just don't want to go. We know nearly 60% of cases can be a history um, of painful or distressing defecation, so they don't want to have that pain again, so they really hold on tightly. Then lesser common uh, organic or anatomical causes, such as hypothyroidism, celiac disease, spinal cord injuries, spina bifida, um, even cystic fibrosis. So the call for stool. Basically we may not get the call for stool or we may only get the call for stool once in 24 hours and the longer the faeces stays in the colon the drier and harder it becomes leading to constipation and painful defecation. Because as I said earlier, what happens is that um, the faeces, because the anus is tighter, um, it shoots the faeces back up into the zygmoid colon where um, it sits for a longer period of time and we end up in this really vicious cycle because the stool starts to become harder and drier. So we get a long delay in passing a stool, it gets larger and harder. And this can stretch and it can even tear larger and harder. And this can stretch and it can even tear the anus. And um, what happens is the anal sphincter can go into spasm for several hours. So a child can be in really excruciating pain for several hours. So of course they're going to attempt to um, defecate again and then it really creates this vicious cycle because it the uh, faeces stays in the bowel even longer. And this is what happens often with the loaded rectum which um, I alluded to with the faecal soiling. So normally faeces um, descends and comes down through the anus here. Now if the urge to go to the toilet is ignored, so they close off their anal sphincter really strongly, it sends the faeces back up into the zygmoid colon. Here it sits and gets harder and drier because we don't get the urge to go to the toilet maybe for another 24 hours or even longer and we start to get this real build up. And what can happen, we get this soft oozy stuff that can then sneak out and ooze out of the anus. The other thing can happen as this um, faeces starts to get harder and drier and larger within the colon, 
it can cause spontaneous anal dilatation. And so what happens is the anus is opened up more than it should be. So it's not tightly closed, but it starts to open a little bit. So what happens is faeces can just sneak out without the child knowing. Now these children aren't being naughty um, or you know they're not trying to ignore their own smell. There's a medical reason for it to be happening and generally speaking what we need to do is clear these children out with laxatives and it's not uncommon for us to treat them with laxatives for at least 12 months. Because what happens to their bowel? It becomes over distended. I always liken it to an overinflated balloon. If you overinflate a balloon, go back to it three weeks later, it'll be on the ground soft, saggy, overstretched. That's what happens to the bowel once we clear it out. It's soft, saggy, overstretched. So they don't get the same sensation of needing to go to the toilet, which is why it's really important to have a good laxative res uh, regime at home and also a good sitting regime of taking advantage of the gastrocolic reflex. Um, so um, yeah, basically there's no quick fix unfortunately. And withholding behaviour is often due to pain or fear. Um, the child um, may be too busy or it's not convenient or they're not allowed to go to the toilet. Um, toilets might be different um, or they might enlighten, they might be dirty. I'd really encourage you all to have a look at your toilets. We know um, like if you can take um, school council into the toilets to have a look at the toilets. If adults aren't willing to use the toilets, we can't expect children to use the toilets. If you're not happy with your school toilets, if you weren't happy to use them, we really can't expect children to be using them either. So we need to improve them. Um, we know constipation can lead to the vicious cycle of painful defecation and faecal soiling. Urinary incontinence because it takes up room within that pelvic region. Bladder overactivity. The bladder can start to contract more because the faeces in the bowel is knocking on the bladder. And these children can also um, start to get recurrent infections, urinary tract infections because they're not emptying their bladder properly. And as I said, it impacts on day and night wetting as well. So basically the impact of constipation. We know um, incontinence present with behavioural scores in the clinical range of 3.5 to 5% uh, more uh, higher than children without continence issue. And they can exhibit behavioural disorders such as separation anxiety, specific phobias, anxiety, certainly attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorders um, sort of go hand in hand with a lot of children with continence issues. Oppositional defiant disorder and they have a poor quality of life so we really need to make sure these children are well understood. So I said I'd just um, tell you quickly how you can um, sit on the toilet properly. It's important to sit with a straight back but then uh, bend forward from the hips. What this does is help, help to straighten out the anorectal junction. You need to lean forward, hands, elbows on the knees and ideally the feet need to be well supported. We don't want feet dangling. Ideally knees slightly higher than the hips also aids the anorectal junction. And it's important not to rush. And as I said a few times, it should only take three to five minutes. And we really want to encourage children to take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex prior to um, getting to school. So hopefully their bowels are clear prior to getting there. Um, can certainly help some issues. So some of the warning signs that you need to be aware of, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you are, would be aware of, is any child needing to go to the toilet frequently, soiled clothes, odour, stomach cramps, avoiding school activities such as camps and excursions. You've got to really explore that with parents as to why, um, as with absenteeism. Or if they're exhibiting any withholding behaviour such as um, crutch holding, you know, doing the wee dance, anything that you think um, is a warning sign or any of these, it's worth discussing it with the parent. 
Janine, we've had a comment come through that yes. I think is worthwhile including at this point in time just to share. Um, and this teacher is obviously working in some fairly uh, remote uh, setting because finding red back spiders has scared some of her students or his students uh, from using the toilets. Um, that's a unique one. We haven't had that come through before. Um, Perhaps we have to have, you know, toilet inspection of the toilets first thing in the morning and a, a handy spray of one of those aerosol uh, um, deferment type sprays. Mm. Look, I think all those um, suggestions from uh, Bronwyn are certainly very valid. Um, and look, I probably don't blame a child for not wanting to sit on the toilet seat um, with a red back spider. It's probably not where I would really want to be sitting either. So maybe it does need to be fumigated. Maybe we need to look at mm. that as to whether there are any nests around as to why um, you have got so many redbacks, whether the toilets need to be cleaned more often. Um, but it's certainly a really valid um, concern. And it's also a, a health and safety issue because imagine if a child actually got bitten by a spider at school. Um, Doesn't bear thinking about. No, no. So I, I think... Um, yeah, it may be something that you do need to discuss with school council how and maybe a fumigator as to whether there is some way that you can really treat mm -hmm. that and reassure children that the toilet is safe. Mm -hmm. um, brings me back, I remember the, the old um, song, Absolutely. Red Back on the Toilet. That's where I went <laughs> <Yes>. as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, certainly we know it's important for you to discuss and I'd encourage you to discuss any concerns with parents and guardians because you do need to work in partnership. Um, encourage a visit to the GP or a continence health professional. You can also give parents or give us a call on the National Continence Helpline, so we're all continence nurses, so we can give you um, individual advice to your parents. We can also refer you to the nearest continence clinic within the area and give you um, some written literature or um, refer you to our website where you can download some written information as well. These children require support and understanding. Um, certainly, um, we'd strongly advocate that you allow children to go to the toilet when they need to go to help prevent a lot of these complications getting worse. Um, and it may mean that you have to allow some children to use the closest toilet and they may need a special little bag in, in the staff toilet which has their wipes and change of clothes to try to negate other children knowing what's going on. And a health care plan is really important. And um, you could consider undertaking the Toilet Tactics Project, which will help your whole school community understand incontinence issues. Um, some of the products you can get. Uh, there's washable products, which can be fantastic for children with continence issues. So they have built-in liners. Um, even one company does a Bonds brand. So they look like normal underwear, so no one's going to know that they're uh, anything special, but they can certainly help. If you're going on school camp, there's waterproof sleeping bag liners that um, can be great. The flushable wipes, but as I said, do have to be careful that they're not using too many of them because that can interfere um, with the block, you know, it can certainly lead to blockage of your sewage system. Ziploc bags are fantastic to keep odours in uh, if there's any faecal issues. And disposable products certainly have a place to um, play and that's where I'd be talking with a continence professional who'd be able to help advise you, the child, the parent, as to what products would be appropriate to use. If you're in a special school or have any special children who have um, fecal accidents when swimming, there are actually containable swimmers you can also get. So support at school. Basically, Remember the impact continence issues can have on a child. So with the right support in school, we can help these children to be happier, improve their self-esteem, help to stop them um, being victims or perpetrators of bullying, increase their peer support and friendship group, it can help them concentrate and improve their school performance, um, and also decrease any um, classroom issues. So support is really important, but it's not only the child that needs to be support, it's also really important that you as a teacher feel well supported within your school community by your principal, by your peers. Um, so you're not really, so you're not feeling alone 
with um, dealing with any child with a continence issue. And it may be involving um, school council too. So you know you are well supported. So just the toilet tactics kit really quickly. Something I'd encourage you all to consider. So use a um, friendly kit to promote healthy bladder and bowel habits within Australian schools and to help maintain or improve school toilets. Um, back in 2012, 100% um, of our pilot schools said it was a worthwhile project, easy to work through, something they would um, do again. And we'd certainly encourage schools to have school toilet charters so they actually take their school toilets seriously. Um, also by surveying um, all your students, you can actually find out things you might necessarily know about your toilets. Um, one of our pilot studies, for instance, their boys' toilet had yellow soap. And so what went around the school was that someone had peed in the soap, so the boys weren't using their soap. So of course that has a huge impact on infection around the school. They changed the colour of their soap to pink. The boys started washing their hands again with soap. So you can really find out things that you might not know. Um, so it's something that I'd really encourage you to consider. Okay, and one more slide to just remind people about our National Continence Helpline. It is a free call. It is staffed by people such as Janine and other trained continence specialists. Uh, it is a 1800 number, 33 It's manned from 8am in the morning till 8pm, uh, Monday to Friday. Uh, it's treated confidentially um, and as I say, they can give you some tips, advice, resources, referrals, um, and please pass that number on to your parents as well. It may um, be uh, something that does help both the family and those in the school setting as well. So I would like to thank you all very much for joining us this evening. I hope you have found it of value. Um, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, kudos to the teacher who wrote in and loved the irony of the Redback story given that our technical support is actually provided by Redback, <laughs> uh, completely unintentional. Um, and I'd also like to uh, give my thanks to Janine for her time uh, and sharing her knowledge around promoting healthy bladder and bowels in the classroom. And I wish you a very good evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. <laughs>